friend, a true friend. Uh, when I screwed up my life and I about lost everything, the, the group of minister friends, on, that list was real short. How many knows your true friends show up when you're at the rock bottom? <laughs> I had a few. He was one of the few. He is at the top of the list, and he was also one of the few that believed in my restoration to be in ministry again to the point that he invited me to his church on several occasions uh, in Stockbridge. He is a pastor at Stockbridge Community Church. And did it so frequently, I became known as rent a uh, They called me rent a down there. So when he needed a break, uh, say, is rent a coming today? And anyway, that was uh, my role. And uh, I just, uh, I love, love this couple. They've done a fabulous jo- job at Stockbridge, been there 26 years at the same church and have led them through all kind of crazy seasons. So longevity in ministry means a lot to me. Uh, but on a personal level, uh, one of the big reasons that I'm here today is because of Pastor Jeff and Miss Rhonda Dawes, and we love them. Would you welcome him to the stage, please? Give him a big God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Dad. I love you. Well, good morning, everybody. It is so, so good to be in the second best church in America. It is a delight to be with you. I am so excited to, to be with you. I, I cannot say enough about uh, the friends that we made years ago. Matter of fact, if you want to know how long ago it was when I was a student pastor here, your pastor and I both had a head full of hair. <laughs> I mean, we had it. That's right. It was back then. But I do want to say uh, today it's an honor. Uh, uh, Jerry and Paulette Chitwood have been mentors of Rhonda and I for over 30 years. They are wonderful friends. We spent some time with them, and we are thankful for them. My sister, Wendy Westmoreland, uh, attends here with her husband, Vaughn. And uh, so, yeah, if you want to know what I would look like with hair, you can look at her. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Someone took our picture after the first server. They took our picture together, and they said, oh, you two look so good together. You know, I thought, well, that was a compliment for me, but I don't know how she took that. Uh, but uh, and said, you look so much alike. But I want to say this to you as seriously as I can, that you have some of the greatest leaders uh, that I know. Uh, Pastor Chad and Danette are some of the greatest leaders. I mean, I am just mean the greatest leaders. I've learned so much from them. Amen. They are so great. <clears throat> he has taught me so much. He made me lose my mind because, uh, you know, I saw him in what great shape he was in years ago, and I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm running. He was running his marathons and all this stuff. I said, well, shh. if he can do it, I can do it. I got out there and ran a half marathon, and when I finished, I said, what idiot talked me into this? <laughs> I thought I'd run my first and last one on the same day. But Pastor Chad is a great communicator, is a great preacher. He's one of the best that I know. And uh, so today, I just want to tell you this. I want to be straight up with you. Don't expect that from me. <laughs> now just lower the expectations because it's not going to be that good. Now, if you're a guest here today, you come back next week, you hear a great preacher. But today, it's probably going to be mediocre, all right? Just lower the, lower the expectations. It is so good to see you. And uh, again, I'm glad to be here and uh, just to be with you. I do feel like I have something to say to you today uh, from the Lord. Uh, you know, I'm a pastor, I'm not an evangelist, and so that means every week I'm preparing messages for my congregation, just like your pastor does, and I don't have, I don't have the, the one that's like red hot, you know, like, okay, this is the go-to. I, every week i got to preach to the same people, so you can't just go to the red hot one, so I don't have one. Matter of fact, I looked over my notes of the last year and thought, looked at all those messages that I'd done and that I was going to, I said, God, which one can I share with them? And I looked over and none of them were any good. I was like, oh, man, that's no good. So I feel like God had to give me a fresh word for you today. And so, so, uh, so you're not getting leftovers. I want you to know that. Today as we begin to talk, I want you to know that uh, there's a guy, a historian named Will Durant, who said this, Will Durant. He said, no civilization, civilization or society has ever been able to survive in history been able to survive in history without a strong religious moral code. We have to have a moral code, everybody. Amen? Amen. This was so evident because 
The Jewish people were in captivity in Egypt for over 400 years. They had forgotten the ways of Abraham that God had shared with them and how he started the Jewish nation. A lot of confusion because they had been in the Egyptian culture. They began to worship like the Egyptians. They began to get the ways of the Egyptians. And, and so when, after that 400 years, God decided that he would deliver them. And so in one day, after 400 years of captivity, God delivered them out of Egypt. It was, it was a miracle. You, maybe you know the story of Moses crossing the Red Sea, man reaching out that staff. I want a staff like that, don't you? He reaches out that staff and calls on God. God parts the water. They cross. They get free. One day, God delivers them. But then again, they're traveling through that desert for 40 years. One lady told me, she said, Pastor, said, uh, do you know why that uh, the children of Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years? Well, I was like, I got what I think, but I want, what do you think? I said, no, why? She said, because he, Moses was a man. He wouldn't stop and ask for directions. <laughs> oh, I do identify with that. So I see some elbows go right there too. That's right, yes. You know, so it took God one day to deliver them out of Egypt, but it, but it took him 40 years to get Egypt out of them. Right. Amen? Amen? It took him 40 years. And one of the things that God used to do that was he wanted to make his teaching, his principles, he wanted to make it simple. And so God began to give Moses the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments was to make it very simple. And, and simply what God wanted them to know through the Ten Commandments and wants you and I to know in the Ten Commandments is this. It's this principle. Think God first. Yes. You see that? Think God first. That's what, that's what God wanted them to know. It's what he wants you to know. It's what he wants me to know. Matter of fact, you get into the New Testament and Jesus gives us the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Amen. That is the first and greatest commandment. And then he said, the second is like it. Love your neighbors yourself. But what he was saying again was, think God first. When you begin to think God first, it changes everything. Amen, everybody? Amen. It changes everything. And so as we begin to go on into the scripture, we see Jesus Matter of fact, you might want to open up your Bible to Matthew uh, 6 and 33, your phone, your iPad, whatever you may have. Because again, Jesus drills down on this principle. And this principle is simply of thinking God first. Look what he says. Matthew 6, 33, Jesus said, seek what everybody win? First. There we go. There we go. There we go. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be what? added. In other words, your life, the things that you desire, the things that you desire in your life are going to happen when you put God first, when you think God first. So I'd like for you to say these three words with me. We're going to say them together. You ready? And we're going to remember them the rest of the day. So here we go. You ready? Come on, let's say these three words. You ready? Think God first. Oh, you did so good. Come on, can you guys on the balcony join in with us here? Let's say it again. You ready? Come on. Think God first. Oh, it got better then, didn't it? I'm expecting some amens from up there. I can tell you that. Think God first. That's the goal, is that God wants you to think God first. So the question that we have today, I want to I talk to you about how to keep God first in your life because I struggle with that. How about you at times? Well, I'm the only one. Oh, I got a bunch of angels in the room. Would you do me a favor? Would you reach up and take your halo and put it under the seat for a moment? Amen? Because God wants to speak to you today. Think God first. So how do, how do you keep God first? I'm going to give you three things today that I think will help you do this. Can we say our three words one more time? You ready? Think God first. Think God first. Think God first. The first thing I want to tell you, if you want to keep God first in your life, is this. Number one is think about God first before you say something to people. Ooh. Has anybody here, has your, have you said something you wish you hadn't said to somebody? Anybody? Let me see your hand. There we go. Yes, all over the house. That's right. 
My mother used to tell me, she said, when I was a little boy, she said, son, your mockingbird mouth is going to get your jaybird backside in trouble. <laughs> I don't know what that meant, but I knew a spanking was coming next. That's all I know. You see, it's called the God filter, right? I mean, we all need a God filter. And the only way that you will ever have a God filter in your life is that you think God first. And I don't know about you, but, but man, I need that filter. Matter of fact, it's the people in my church sometimes, they'll say, Pastor, we can't believe some of the things you say. I said, well, my goodness, you, wouldn't, you definitely wouldn't be able to believe the things that I don't say. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I told my wife, Rhonda, I said, Rhonda, listen, if I ever have to go to the hospital and they medicate me, do not let anybody in. I tell people in my church, I say, listen, I love you. I, I love you to death. And, and, and if I get sick and they put me on medication, I told Rhonda, don't come and see me. Because the God feel to go away when they medicate you, right? I don't know what I might say to them. That's right. I have never been drunk. So I don't want to try, try it. You know what I'm saying? I have a hard enough time living like I do, not saying what comes to my mind. Amen, everybody? We're getting real today, aren't we? It's like, man, it got real. That's right. So I want you to remember this. Matter of fact, uh, you, you need a God filter because you may not be as quick as a young man I'm going to tell you about. The young man got a job at the grocery store, first job. He was so excited. You know, he's working in the produce section in the grocery store, his first week on the job. And this lady comes up and she says, young man, I want a half a head of lettuce. Half a head of lettuce? He's like, we have a half a head of lettuce? He says, oh, let me go talk to my supervisor. He goes back to the supervisor. He says, Sir, there's a nut job out there who wants a half a head of lettuce. Well, little did he know she had followed him in. <laughs> she followed him in, and, and he said, Yes, sir, there, there's a nut job who wants a half a head of lettuce, but this fine young lady wants the other half right here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Some of you are going to wake up tonight laughing about that. <laughs> but look what the Bible says when it comes to speaking. James 1 and 19. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to want everybody listen. to listen and slow to what? Speak. Slow to speak and slow to become angry. angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Amen. I don't know about you, but I have a problem of think God first when I get mad. How about you? When I get mad, I don't want to think about God, do you? I don't, I mean, that's not what comes to my mind. But when I get mad, I know this is shocking you, but pastors, when we get mad, the first word that comes to our mouth are not, oh, Jesus, you're so wonderful. We love you, Jesus. It doesn't come to our mind. No, it comes. I want to tell them. They tell me. I'm going to tell them. <laughs> Just like you. That's the way we think, too. And so when we get mad, listen, when we get angry and upset, all of a sudden it opens the door for the devil to put some thoughts in our minds. Amen. And some of you have said some things that come straight from the devil. Amen. Amen. I have too. I would have never said that had that, you know, I would have never said that had I not been mad. And so we've all said some things that we know that, that the devil will, when we don't think for God first, even when we get angry, the devil will put kind of, all kind of God awful thoughts in your mind. Amen, everybody. Amen. Amen. You see, what I want you to understand is this, because when you get mad, you will say some things. And not only will you say things to people, you will say things about people. Amen? Watch this. You will never feel good about somebody you're talking bad about. Did you hear that? Oh, if your marriage is struggling, let me tell you, it will never get better when you're out here talking to your friends about how bad your husband or your wife is. It'll never, you'll never feel better about your husband or wife. Amen, everybody? Listen, if your relationship is struggling between your parents and you, it will never get better as long as you're out here blasting your parents to everybody else. Amen, everybody? If your relationship is struggling between your employer and you, it will never get better as long as you're out here talking bad about them. Amen? And if your relationship, if your relationship with your church is not so good or your pastor is not so good, it certainly will not get better if you're out here talking bad about them. Amen, everybody? Amen. And so never expect to feel good about somebody when you're talking bad about them. That's a great lesson. You see, we have to learn to 
We have to learn to pray about what we think about. Did you hear that? God already knows what you're thinking. And let me tell you something. Boy, I can have some God-awful thoughts. How about you? You ever, you ever been sitting in church like right now and have a bad thought? Anybody in this room besides me? Yeah. I mean, I, you, you should be about to preach and all of a sudden have a bad thought. It's amazing how the devil works like that. I mean, you will have some God-awful thoughts and, and it's like, oh, no. And so we, don't, we, say, we want to say, oh, oh, I don't want to think about it. Oh, I don't think. No, you should pray about it. God, I just had a bad thought. Lord, help me with this. He already knows everybody. Amen? Amen. And so you don't have to hide that. Here's what I want to tell you is that when you pray about what you think about, it helps you. And I tell my people, my church, I said, sometimes when you're upset with somebody, sometimes you just need to write it out. And I was like, you know, I would encourage them to journal. Just write it out because once you see what you might say, it might change what you say. Amen? Amen. And, and so I said, write it out and see if the, if the Holy Spirit will help you. If you think God first before you say something to people, the Holy Spirit will help you to write it in a notebook. But if you, don't, if you don't think God first before you say something to people, guess what? You'll write it on Facebook. Woo, somebody. Oh, the devil done. He forgot your tongue. He got into your thumbs. Woo. I know some people, their, their life will get a whole lot better if I could just cut their thumbs off. Amen. Mm, mm, mm. You've been there, haven't you? I meet with so many people who have, who have just blasted people in their own family right there on social media. How do you mend that up? That wasn't anointed of God. That was straight out of the pit of hell. Every man, amen. Yeah, I said every man. <laughs> Amen. You see, most of us don't have an anger problem. We have a thank God first problem. If we could just thank God first, it would change everything in our relationships. Can I tell you, if you begin to thank God first, if you begin to thank God first, your relationship between your, your spouse will get better. If you can begin to think God first, your relationship between your parents will get better. If you can begin to think God first, your relationship between you and your teacher will get better. If you can begin to think God first, your relationship between, between your employer will get better. You, you and your employer will get better. If you can think God first, your relationship between your mother and father-in-law, it will get better, and the turkey at Thanksgiving will not be as tough, everybody. Amen. Think God first. Remember, we want to think, think about God before we say something to people. The second thing I would like to share with you is this. Number two is this. Is start your day with God's word and your week with God's people. Yes. Amen, everybody. Amen. I love this passage of scripture. John 8, 31 and 32. Look what Jesus said. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed upon him. Look at this. If you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what, everybody? Free. Make you free. You cannot, you cannot live in the world and not know the truth and expect to be free. It's a lie that binds you up. Amen? Amen? And I want to talk to you about this real quickly. Again, I'm a pastor, okay? I'm always encouraging people to read the Bible. Read the Bible. Always. Why? Because they need freedom and need truth. And I want you to know the Word of God is like water. In some ways, it's like water. Like how many of you have ever been swimming in a pool or a lake, somewhere in the ocean? How many of you have ever been swimming like that? Right, let me see your hands. Okay. All of us. Some of you people have never been swimming. God bless you. What I want you to know is this, is that when you get into that pool and you've been in that pool soaking for, you know, swimming around or playing around that water for about an hour, you've got to go to the bathroom. You ever notice that? It's like, I've got to go. Where's the bathroom? I've got to go. And please do not TT in the pool. <laughs> I'm sorry. <you're>... Please. <laughs> but what I want you to know is when you, the reason that has to happen 
is because when you get in the water, you get in the water, you don't realize it, but the water is getting in you. See so how that happens? You don't even realize it. You're not drinking the water, but your body is absorbing the water. The water is getting in you. And what I want to tell you is that I tell people, you need to read the Bible. I say, Pastor, I read the Bible all. I tried reading the Bible before, but I can't. I don't get anything out of it. I don't get anything out of it. Listen, I want to say this to you. Don't worry about what you're getting out of it, but when you get in God's Word, God's Word will get in you. Amen, everybody? It'll get in you. Don't you worry about that. Because there's going to be a season in your life, you've been reading the Bible and you felt like you got nothing out of it, but when you're going through the storms of life, all of a sudden you feel like that you're all alone and that nobody's with you and nobody cares about you. You're going to need to know, you're going to need to know that He will never leave you nor forsake you, that He's going to be with you all the way to the end. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Amen. You need to know God. God's word. You need to know that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, everybody. Amen. You need to know. Oh, boy. Mm -mm. I need a few more amens. You've got to know that because you're going to go through times like that. You need God's word. And then Hebrews 10, I love this passage, Hebrews 10, 25. Look what he says. He said, let us not, let us, notice that, let us, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Notice that. But he said, let us, notice that, let us encourage one another all the more as we see the day approaching. Do you remember our three words that we talked about at the beginning? What are they? Think God first. You see, some people come to church because they want to get something out of it. And when you always come with, i got to get something out of it, you're going to leave discouraged many times. So you'll leave this church and you'll, you'll leave this service and you'll say, I didn't really get anything out of that. When you're all about getting, you will be disappointed. But when you do what the Word of God says, He said, let, a, let us encourage each other. Amen, everybody? In other words, when you get up on a Sunday morning and you come to be with your family or you go to your small group and you get to be with your, your people there, it's not about you. When you walk in the door and when you walk in that parking lot and you say, I'm here today to lift somebody up. I'm here to encourage somebody. I'm on an assignment from the Heavenly Father today and my job is to lift somebody up because when you begin to encourage people, you'll become an encouraged person. Amen, everybody? Encouraging people are encouraged people. Discouraging people are discouraged people. Amen, everybody? You get to choose. Will I be encouraging? Will I be encouraged? If so, I'll be an encourager. You see, one of the things that the devil does to all of us, every one of us, those that are watching online as well, the devil does to us is he gets us to believe a lie. Man, we, we, he gets us to believe a lie. He will tell you things that are not true. And, he, and when he does that, most of the time, you get imprisoned with fear. And you won't move, amen? He will tell you a lie about your past. He'll tell you, because you've done that, you can't do so and so. Amen, everybody? He'll lie to you. He'll tell you that. And he'll say, because, you know, the fear of the future that you shouldn't do that. And so he'll tell you a lie. It reminds me of a story of a guy named Harry Houdini. Harry Houdini was an escape artist. In the, in the late uh, 1800s, and the early 1900s, he was it. I mean, they would take this guy, put him in a straitjacket, buckle it all up, and throw him in the water. And he would, he would get out of that straitjacket before he drowned. It was, it was amazing. And in order to get people to come and see his shows, he would go to every town, and, and he would go there, and he would tell the local sheriff, off, sheriff, he would say, listen, why don't you put me in your jail, and then I'm going to escape out of that jail. And so sure enough, everybody would come and see me. Come into town. First thing you do is go to the, to the sheriff there. They lock him in the jail. And within 10 minutes, he'd be out of that jail. And everybody like, wow. And they would come to his shows. One guy, one sheriff, he said, I'm coming to your town. And then Harry Houdini made his way into the town. And the sheriff got him to believe a lie. So when the sheriff put him in the cell, everybody was all around. He shut the door. He took the key. And he just rattled the key in the lock. He didn't lock the door. But he told Harry Houdini, he said, the door's locked, Harry. Now, get out. And because Harry Houdini believed the lie, 
Every time he tried to get out, he locked himself right into that jail. He couldn't get out. It was the only time he could ever get out. He could not get out. They finally had to let him out after trying for hours to get out because every time he kept locking himself in because he believed a lie. Let me tell you something. Every time the devil gets you to believe a lie, you are locking yourself in. Amen? You, you are, listen, you are behind bars because he lied to you and said it's never going to get better. He will tell you, he will tell you, you're never going to be better financially. You're never going to be better relationally. You're never going to be better uh, physically. You're never going to be better spiritually. You're never going to get out of this depression. This anxiety is always going to be there. That this person is always going to be a problem. That they're always going to hold you back. You're never going to get ahead. I'm going to tell you in the name of Jesus, that is a lie. And until you, until you go back and say, hear what Jesus said. Remember what he said? He said, if you will continue my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The only thing that's going to get you out of where you are is the word of God. And when you put the word of God in your heart, the Bible says that you will be free, and he will unlock those doors that are holding you back, and you will find the freedom of Almighty God. Amen, everybody? Come on, let's give God a hand. Hallelujah. Let's give God a hand. He's good. Remember our three words, everybody. Remember those. What are they? Think God first. He's thinking God first. My question to you is this. What lie are you believing? What lie are you believing? Are you believing the lie you'll never get married? Are you believing the lie that we're, this marriage is never going to make it? Are you believing the lie that financially we'll never get out of this? What lie are you believing? And remember today that God's word says, he who the Son of Man sets free is free indeed. Amen? He, can I remind you that he conquered death, hell, and the grave. There is nothing too big for our God. Amen? Amen. Nothing too big for him. I want to share this last thing with you. Number three. Well, before I do that, can we say our three words one more time? You ready? What are they? Think God first. Think God first. The third thing I would share with you, if we want to put God first in our life, is this. Is look for the small signs of God working for your good. Look for those small signs. God is always working. Look at this passage. I love this passage. And look what it says. James 1 and 17. Every good what, everybody? Every good action. Notice that. Every good action and every perfect gift is from who? God. You know what that means? That means when someone is good to you and does something to help you, they didn't just do that on their own, that God went before you. Amen. Did you hear that? Everything that begins to go your way and you thought, well, they were really nice to me. When they were really kind, I mean from the cashier who is about to turn her light off when you get up there, right before you step there, there she said, well, you can come on through. Oh, that's an act of God at Walmart, isn't it? <laughs> hallelujah. Oh, bless her, Jesus. That's what I said. Hallelujah. God bless you. <laughs> Every little thing like that is God working in your favor. And it goes on and says this. These good gifts come down from the creator of the sun, moon, and stars who does not change like they're shifting shadows. I read of a story by a lady by the name of Diane Aiden who went to church on a Sunday morning just like you've come here. She went in and she was listening to her pastor talk and their pastor was sharing that how that when he was working with someone at a secular job, they drove him crazy. He said, they just drove me crazy. And he went on to explain said, so this guy said, we would work together and said, every time that we would be in our, the work vehicle driving to like a Home Depot to get some supplies for us to do our job, said we would circle the parking lot, couldn't find a parking space, and we'd circle one more time. And, and as soon as we'd round the corner, there would be one right there in the front. And as soon as we pulled in, he stopped say, oh, wait a minute. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Would you look at God? He said, he said, would you look at God? He said, he'd get out of the truck. And he'd walk, begin to walk into the store, and we'd walk along, and he'd find a nickel on the ground. He'd pick it up and stop. He'd hold it up and say, oh, wait a minute, everybody. Would you look at God? 
said he wouldn't stop there. So we'd go to the store and said, we was checking out, you know, we'd go to the cash register and she would check us out and they'd pull out the receipt and the lady say, oh, and by the way, sir, just want to let you know that today you saved $25 on this. He grabbed that receipt from that lady, hold it up in the middle of the store and say, would you look at God, everybody? Would you look at God? That pastor said, I just hold my hand and go, oh my God. I said, I'm going to kill this man. <laughs> Diane felt like many of you, like, you know, that could be a little annoying. Someone continually saying that. But Diane said that she went to Sam's herself with her daughter after church. After they'd had lunch, they went to Sam's to pick up some things for her work. And they went through there, and she got the supplies she needed, and she was getting ready to check out. She reached for a credit card, and it wasn't there. But thank God she had cash that she could use to check out with. And as that, she reached in and got her cash out. She used it. You know, she, she, the lady said, would you like a receipt? She said, yes, I've got to have the receipt so that I can get reimbursed for this. I've used my cash. And so on the way out at the door of Sam, she and her daughter began to proceed out, and the lady come by with a little marker and said, oh, can I have your receipt, ma'am? She said, sure. And she handed it to her. She checks it off. She puts a little mark on it. She go, walks out the door. She walks out the door of Sam. She begins to make the exchange from her hand the receipt is in into her wallet. She has her wallet open. She's ready to make this exchange. And when she does, somehow a big gust of wind blew, and about that time it blew her receipt away. And she's freaked out. Diane's like, what am I going to do? She's telling her daughter, honey, we got to find that receipt. And so they're walking. They're going all through the parking lot, looking under cars and everything, and panicking because they cannot find that receipt. And about that time, Diane stands up. She said, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. And a big gust of wind blew right in Diane's face. And when it did, she felt that wind blowing. And also she felt something, something uh, twitching on her ankle. It felt like a flickering there. And she looked down and there was a piece of paper. She reached down on her ankle. She pulled that piece of paper up and it was her receipt. You know what Diane did? Would you look at God, everybody? Would you look at God? Would you look at God? Would you look at God? I want to tell you something. When I was sitting in your pastor's office watching you come in and seeing the great work that God is doing here at this church, you know what my heart said? Would you look at God? Would you look at God, everybody? Would you look at God? Would you look at God? When I saw all those beautiful children that was, that was coming in and going through their kids' church area, and I thought the next generation's in great hands, would you look at God, everybody? Would you look at what God is doing? When I come in, I heard this beautiful music and these bands and all them singing. I said, would you look at God? But I know there's some people that are sitting in this room right now that you know you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God. You know he delivered you. He set you free. He brought you out. He picked you up. He lifted you up. You would not be here if it wasn't for God. And I'm looking at you today and I'm saying to all of you and all of you, would you look at God because I'm seeing the hand of God. As I look at you, everybody. Amen you look at God, as I look at the great job that your pastor and, and Danette are doing here in this church, I just say, would you look at God? I'm going to tell you something. I pray for your pastor all the time. You're welcome. <laughs> if it was my prayer, not for my prayers, you wouldn't be able to stand him. <laughs> God has done an incredible work in them and through them and continues to, to do it. You see what I'm saying? That's God. When you, if you knew me, if you knew who I really, really am and really was, then you would be saying yourself, you'd say, would you look at God? Up? That is God up there. Amen? Amen. And, if, <laughs> and if I knew you, <laughs> oh, if I knew you, <laughs> if I knew you, I'd say, oh, God, you, I see you picked them up, oh, God. I see, Lord, I met some people that were on drugs. Somebody told me, they said, I was a drug addict, but no longer one because of God, amen? I was broken and brown, but God has freed me. I'm looking at the work of God. As I look at all of you, it's the work of God, everybody. Would you look at God? Would you look at God? Today, as we end our time together, the question I have for you is this. 
What lie are you believing? Because the devil has taken our three words out of your mind. And what are our three words, everybody? Think God first. And if you can think God first, you can find hope on the darkest day. You know, you look at maybe myself and your pastor, and you, maybe it's real easy for you to forget that we're human beings and that we have problems, struggles. This year has been a very trying year for all of us. I know it's been trying for you as well. For me, this year, my beautiful wife Rhonda's right here, by the way. I just thought about her and got happy. I'm going to get to take her home after a while. Love on her. Can you give Rhonda a hand, by the way? The reason I said that, because I thought about the time that she's had to, we walked through this together. This year, with COVID hit, we had a church of 1,000 people. It was thriving like this church. 26 years of our lives we'd given. We poured ourselves into people like your pastor pours into you. We've loved people that's hurt when they've been hurting so bad. We've tried to mend the wounds of people. We've given our life. When COVID hit, of course, you know that every church in America basically shut down. And that was discouraging. But when we opened back up, they didn't come back. I thought, well, they'll come next week. And a few more show up. I thought, well, you know what? When, you know, if school will start back, well, school will start back. Well, school has not started back. I mean, in our area, it hasn't started. Hopefully, this August is going to start back, but it hasn't. I want to tell you that I've become so discouraged. I think it's one of the first times, Chad, in 26 years that I really thought I'm done. I can't do this again. My heart was so broken. And then you throw on top of that, you know, with pastors, you, you, your children, the devil will do it. He will attack your children. Sometimes to get to you, it seems like, doesn't it? And we're walking through a very difficult time again with one of our children. And it's been going on and on. And I was just weary and worn down. And I thought, what, God, this is it. I'm done. And this is what I want you to know, that God gave me a word. Because I was reading the Bible. One of those days I was just, one of the days I just get up every morning at 6 a.m. and read the Bible or get anything out of it or not. And I was reading the Bible. I got to Haggai 289. And out of nowhere, did not expect to get anything out of it. Just reading it because I read it. I read it, try to read the Bible through each year, just reading it. And the Bible says, Haggai 2.89, the silver's mine and the gold is mine. And the future glory of this place will be greater than the former glory. I said, would you look at God? And I want to tell you something. Even though the people didn't show up immediately, they sent their money. Hallelujah. (laughs) I want to tell you that we had... We gave over $100,000 to missions that last year. This year we're on track to give $150,000 to missions. People got saved and people are getting saved. Our church is growing back and people are beginning to come back. People are getting saved. It's a whole new generation that's coming up. I'm saying, would you look at God, everybody? Would you look at God? Would you look at God? Would you look at God? Come on, stand with me, everybody. God is so good. It comes to one of those situations where I had to quit believing the lie. When I quit believing the lie that it was never going to happen, then guess what? God did it. Now, here's the deal. Some of you walked in with a lie today. You walked in with a lie. Some of you walked in and said, I can never make it without this boyfriend who's abusing me. That's a lie. That is a lie. You walked in with a lie. I don't know what lie you walked in, but you already know it. It's already been identified in your mind. You've been believing a lie, and you like you like Harry Houdini. You are locked in.
But you've got the key. And the key is you believe God's word. And God's word will change you. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you an opportunity to get out of your seats from the balcony here it's on the main floor as well. And you're going to walk to this altar. And what you're doing is you're going to exchange a life for truth. The reason I invite you to the altar is because it's at the altar that God can alter your life. Amen, everybody? And so when I count to three, they're going to begin playing this music. You're going to get out of your seat from all over this building. And today's the day that you're going to call the devil out. And you're going to say, no longer am I believing this lie, but today I'm going to be free in Jesus' name. Are you ready? One. You getting ready? He's starting to tell you now, no, don't you go. He's, you're starting to hear that now. Two. He's saying, oh, you can't do that. It's not for you. But when I say this next number, you're going to get out and you're going to make hell mad and heaven's going to set you free. Are you ready? Are you ready? Here we go. Three. Step out right now. Come on. All over the church, step out. Come on. In the name of Jesus. Come on. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We hope that the message was a blessing to you and an encouragement to you. If it was, we'd just like to take a few more seconds of your time and ask you to do a few things. First of all, if you don't mind, there's a digital connection card that you could submit and, and, and send our way, and it'll let us stay connected to you more personally. First, it'll let, you, let us know who you are. Second, how frequent, frequently you tune in. And also, there's a place for prayer requests, and we would love to partner with you and pray about what's going on in your life. The second thing that would be great is if you could just take a moment, click a link, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you can stay connected with what's going on at The Point every week. And also, man, if this was a blessing to you today, it might be an encouragement and a blessing to somebody in your friend group or in your network of influence. So why don't you just share this video and pray that God uses it to encourage them as well. Finally, if uh, you'd like to consider blessing this ministry financially, there's a giving link at the bottom. You can click down there and that'll help us continue to throw out videos like this that could be a life changer for somebody out there. So guys, thank you again for joining us. We're so blessed that you did. We're so honored to have you as a part of our online family. And we want you to know one more thing. We love you so much and we can't wait to see you next time.